Hi folks, my name is Simon Bennett and I'm here to talk about the OAuth Z Attack Proxy. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to get a little bit of information about you. Um, what I'd like to know is backgrounds of people in the room. Um, so if you could put your hand up if you've got a background in development to be one of the builders. Lots of developers, that's good. Uh, if you've got a background in pen testing and one of the breakers, you put your hand up. And background in, um, if you're one of the protectors, one of the um, system admins. Excellent. Uh, and I'd also just like to know roughly how much experience people have in application security. So if you're relatively new, you know, a couple of years experience, you put your hand up. And you've got medium amount of experience, you have three, four, five years. And any old hands here have been doing it for ages. Right, really good mix of people, that's great to see. Um, right, my name's Simon Bennett, so I work for a company called Sage in the UK. Um, uh, Peachtree in the US is part of the group as well. Um, now, I want to stress that uh, Z Attack Tax pro Proxy is not uh, associated with Sage in any way. It's uh, something uh, myself and various other people are doing. Uh, but um, Sage has been very um, supportive of all of the um, security work that I do. Um, what I'd like to do is, I mean, I will be showing you a demo. It seems a bit silly to tell you about a tool and not show it to you. Um, I'll tell you about some of the fun functionality as well. Uh, before I get started on that, I'd like to give you a bit of background. And I want to do that because it means it's something you can't really pick up from the website as well. And really, it's trying to answer one question that I guess get asked quite a few times, and that's, uh, does the world need another pen test tool like this? Because there are quite a few other, other tools in the same space, and it's actually a very relevant question. Uh, I think it's a very co good question. So I want to explain why I released the Z-Attack proxy um, and why I think it's different from some of the other tools that are out there. So I'm going to start off with a statement. And it's this statement. It's my statement. I'm sure other people have made it before. You may agree or disagree. But I really believe you can't build secure web applications unless you know how to attack them. And you need to know what the bad guys are going to do. And I think that's important. And I kind of relate it to, you know, imagine trying to build a castle in the Middle Ages um, if you don't know anything about siege engines or sapping techniques. First time anyone serious tried to attack it, they would, they would um, overwhelm your castle. You know, there's, so you have to know what the bad guy's going to do. Uh, and when we're developing software, in the software development process, we have three sets of technical people. We have the developers who build it. We have the QA people, the functional testers, who are really the representatives of the end users. They do all the bizarre and strange things that end users do. And then we've got the pen testers. And the pen testers are the representatives of the evil hackers. But we have a bit of a problem. And that's for most developers, um, penetration testing is a black art. Developers tend to work quite closely with QA. Some QA people might not realize this. But developers do understand you know, about how the users use their software. But um, pen testing tends to be seen as very different. The pen testers will often be from a different part of the organization, or they might be from a completely different organization. So you'll have somebody turn up, and statistically speaking, it will be a bloke. And statistically speaking, he will be wearing black. <laughs> OK, I'm a cliche. Uh, and he will use, um, he or she, will use various forbidden tools and techniques, things that the developers just don't understand at all. And this was really brought home to me a couple of years ago uh, when I was asked to pen test an application. Uh, and it was an application I didn't know anything about, uh, so I arranged to have a meeting with the guys who developed it. And they, uh, the project manager sort of went through um, you know, what the application did, um, explained as a client server application that added this new um, web interface, and I explained you know, who I was and the sort of things I could do and how I could help them. Uh, and then they gave a demo, and the developers started giving the demo. And we got to the first web form, and the project manager had clearly been listening to what I said. And he said, he looked at me and said, Ian, you don't think you were doing an injection attack here? And I was like, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> well, shall we go? Uh, nervous glances around, the developers nervously passed the keyboard to me. So I just put in your standard script alert. You know, standard JavaScript alert, nothing fancy, nothing clever, tried out, it failed. Didn't work. Uh, they were using a standard library which stopped it, a horrible error message, it doesn't matter. The important thing was that the attack failed. But I've been listening to them as well, and it was a client serve application, and the, it was usually the administrator, manager who would be on the road who would be using the web application, 
And any really kind of lower level people who would be using the desktop client to enter this information. So I asked them to put the information, more information in, another record, which they did via the desktop client, and then I got the keyboard off them again and did exactly the same attack from the desktop client. And of course, they hadn't changed the desktop client. Why would they? It was new functionality they were putting in. Desktop client didn't know anything about cross-site scripting because um, it had been developed years ago. And so the attack vector went in, we went back to the web application, and there was the pop-up. Now, the important thing about this story is not that I did anything particularly clever. It was pretty trivial stuff. Anyone with any pen test experience could have done exactly the same thing. The important thing to me was the reaction. And you know, I started to explain how um, you know, the attacker could then compromise the administrator's um, session. They could steal a session, do all sorts of nasty things. But I could tell I was only really talking to the project manager because the developers were just sitting there staring at the screen in horror. And I don't know what they were thinking, obviously, but I think it was something along the lines of, oh my god, he just compromised a web application in, what, 20 seconds? And the really important thing was, I got the application about a week later and I couldn't find a single cross-site scripting vulnerability in it anywhere. And I thought that was brilliant. Because uh, it meant it, they really got it, they really understood it. It became personal. Um, I found lots of other vulnerabilities, but that's, you know, to be expected. But they could actually see what someone would do and how they would do it. Uh, so I thought that was great. And what I started to do then, I started to um, teach developers and QA people basic pen testing techniques. And this seems to go down well. And I think it's very important to say that this is, you know, there are no silver bullets in um, security, so this definitely isn't it. And, you know, there's all these other wonderful things you should be doing. So, you know, this is just uh, one of the many things you should be doing. We often talk about defense in depth in developing applica in applications in the code. I think we should talk about defense in depth as the software development process. The more of these things we can do, the better. So I teach people basic pen testing techniques. One of the first things people ask, particularly developers, is what tools should we use? And I try and explain that you, know, you can do quite a lot with a browser and a bad attitude. Um, <laughs> but it's clear that you know, the right tool, uh, used for the right purpose, is actually very powerful and can show you what's going on. So I had to think and try to think of exactly what sort of tool would be the one I would like to recommend to developers. I made a set of criteria, and then I tried to find a tool that matched those criteria. I failed. I couldn't find a tool out there which matched what I wanted to recommend to people. So I did something rather stupid. Uh, I released one. So I released a tool which I called the Z-Attack Proxy and just over a year ago. And it had various criteria that I thought were important. Um, not everything that I wanted, but it was a start. And one of the important things was it wasn't written from scratch. Um, that would be silly, particularly for someone like me. Um, um, so what I'd done... <coughs> I'd actually found, uh, the closest tool I'd found to what I wanted was a tool called the Paris Proxy, which I'm sure most of you in here have heard of, have probably used. And it's a nice intercepting proxy, it's, I, I really, really like it, um, but it hadn't been updated for years. Um, the developers had taken that closed source, so it had been languishing. Uh, it had some nice features, and was the closest thing um, that, to what I wanted. Actually, it wasn't the closest thing to what I wanted. The, what I actually, the closest thing to what I wanted was a version of Paros that was sitting on my PC. Because I'm a developer and I like learning about things, particularly security. So I started playing around with the Paros code years ago just to see how it worked. Um, and then I realized there were some things I didn't like about it. So I started tweaking its open source. I can do that. It's for my own benefit. And then I realized that the version of Paros I've been packing around with was actually closer to what I wanted than the old version of Paros. So I tidied that up. Uh, Easy use, so try to make things a little bit easier to use. Um, I think easy use is important anyway. Um, some pen test tools, they seem to think the opposite. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't say that really, but, uh, but particularly because this is something I wanted developers to use, and best will in the world, developers won't be using a pen test tool all day, all day every day. They shouldn't be anyway, uh, otherwise they'd be pen testers. So I wanted something that they could actually do development, then pick up a tool, and it'd be obvious, relatively obvious what they need to do. They must have to remember things, use it for what they needed to, and then go back to using their um, IDEs. Um, so ease of use was important. The other thing I thought was important was help pages. I evaluate quite a lot of open source. Um, if I'm ever doing a new application, I'll you know, break it down to components and work out what open source I think would fit. And if it's something new I haven't heard of, then I'll look at the help pages. I don't want to look at the help pages. I want it to be so intuitive that I can just use it without doing that. But if it's actually any good, then I want to use it more and I want to push the boundaries properly. 
And then I'll probably want to look at the help pages. Um, so I want to know that they're there. And I want to know that they're fairly well covered, you know, what the application does. So I think help pages are important. Um, so I did quite a few of them. I'm not saying they're any good, but they are there. Uh, the free bit was um, very, um, very important uh, because something I was aiming at developers and there's the best will in the world, I couldn't go to in Boston and say, look, this great tool that developers should be using, it's for pen testing, hacking, but don't worry about that, and it costs money. That just wouldn't go down well. It had to be free. Um, and I wanted it to be open source because, well, I started learning about Paros by looking at the source. Um, so I wanted it as a tool that people could actually learn about application security and actually look at it and see how it was doing things. So I forked Paros, and one thing I did, um, I tried to make sure that people felt they could actually contribute. I didn't want it to be my project. Um, I think it's very important that I mean, there are certain software um, sort of security tools that are open source ones, but they're very tightly controlled by a de one developer or a company. I really don't have a problem with that. You know, if you release open source, and it's entirely up to you how you manage it. But I think the most powerful open source tools are the ones that have a community behind them, where everybody can take part. So I wanted something that people could actually actively take part in. Uh, so I thought was very important. One thing I did do was uh, I submitted to, to OWASP, which was a bit of a kind of, yeah, I didn't think anything would come of, it, come of it. And all of a sudden it got adopted. And that was quite a shock to me. And suddenly the um, downloads shot up. It became very popular. I think partly because it was a fork of Paros, but also with an OWASP brand behind it, suddenly people wanted to download it. So if you are developing any open source tools and you want to get them out there, then the OWASP route is very good. I can recommend it. So one year later, and the important thing is we have a new logo. And I've got loads of stickers, so if you want another sticker, just please come over to see me afterwards at any time. So we've made quite a few releases. Um, so we start off on 1.0. 1.3.0 um, was, I think, released in June, something like that. Now we've done, we've uh, made various other releases since then, bug fix releases. And I think this is very important. I mean, you might say that's bad because there are bugs in it, um, but I'm going to claim it's good. Uh, it's good because... People have been reporting problems. They've been, if you look at the um, issues page on the um, Google um, homepage for Zap, you'll find loads of enhancement requests and quite a few bugs that people have been reporting. But if there's anything critical, any bugs which really stop Zap from working, then we investigate them as soon as we can and we fix them. Um, so we are supporting version 1.3 and we'll keep on supporting that until we release 1.4. If you find any serious problems and you work with us, then we will find those bugs and we will fix them. Fix them. So that's very important. Actually, um, a couple of weeks ago, someone found a problem. And it was great because they worked with us. Um, you know, we had problems reproducing, it, um, reproducing the, the issue, um, but they set debugging. Um, we, could, we generated some debug releases, which they tried out. And eventually, we narrowed it down. So there will be a 1.3.3 coming out fairly soon with that bug fixing, and a few others if we can kind of slip them in as well. Uh, but we will carry on. Um, releasing bug fix releases for any important problems. Um, so this release has been downloaded 4,600 times, I think it is, by um, I checked this morning. Um, it's difficult to tell how many people are actually using Zap, um, but I think at least 10,000 people have downloaded it. Um, this release, we, have, we haven't done much publicity about it, we tweeted about it, but otherwise it's people just picking up the latest version, or um, if they've got check for updates turned on, they'll get an alert and hopefully they'll come and download it. So it is no longer me, I'm delighted to say. There are about five of us who are actually cutting code, and there's a lot of other people who are making other contributions, whether they're doing testing or translations. And one thing I think is very important is the internationalization. Um, the original Paros code was all hard-coded strings in there, and I couldn't bring myself to do that. It was just horrible. Uh, my background's in um, server-side web application development. Um, and I just, you can't put hard-coded strings in, you don't do it. Um, so I started internationalizing things, and then people um, started doing translations. So we made a big effort, and it's completely, it's fully internationalized now. If you find any strings that aren't, then they are bugs. Um, so it's fully internationalized. And it has now been translated into 10 languages, and I'm really pleased about that. And so a lot of contributors have been doing that, and that's great. But we want more, so please, if you can help translate. I mean, I'm rubbish at um, spoken languages. Um, but if you can help, then we'd love to have that a really long list. It's really difficult to know who's actually using Zap because you know people just download it and there's, it's on various security distribution distributions now. 
Um, but the impression I get is it's actually mostly professional pen testers. There's not so many developers, which is, I mean, it's great. I'm really pleased professional pen testers are using it. Um, and I get, I've been told off for telling people it's a development um, pen test tool. I think, no, we use it with professionals. Um, but I really would like to get it in the hands of developers, and I'll explain a bit more why. Uh, but to give you an idea, uh, I mean, I hate counting lines of code. I mean, it's a very poor metric. But I did do it just to get an idea of how much work we put in. And it's approximately 55% to 45% of the code base. And this is not extra libraries we brought in, so any other brought in. So any of the other um, things like JBrofuzz is separate to that. So actually lines of code are part of Paros. And actually, we're not using quite a lot of the Paros code now. So it's probably a 50-50 split. So we've doubled the amount of code that's in Paros. So these are the principles. These are things that I thought were important. Um, and I've already, already mentioned that it's free open source. Um, so I want people to be able to actually see what it does and how it does it. I don't want a black box thing, something where you just press a button and it finds some vulnerabilities and tells you the, these are the vulnerabilities. It's a tool that I want people to use to, you know, where it can do automation, great, it'll do that, but also should help you find vulnerabilities, the ones that are a bit harder. And that's not just for pen testers. I want developers to get a bit involved in that as well, as much as possible. Cross-platform, this is very important for me. I mean, I develop on Linux. Most people where I work develop on Windows. A lot of people are developing on Macs now. What's the point of having a platform-dependent tool when you're testing a web app? I, I don't get that. So it is cross-platform. It's written in Java, so if you've got a full JVM, that will run on there. Uh, the ease of use thing is very important. Um, even for professional pen testers, you might have got used to difficult-to-use tools, but I think it's actually important. Ease of use is important. And that means that if you raise an issue that's to do with ease of use, we will take it seriously. So, you know, that's almost as serious as this, equivalent to a bug. You know, we want it to be as easy as use, to use as possible, and it's, it's not as good as I'd like, but it's getting there. Easy to install. Um, this is important for me as well, because if a developer has to download half a dozen things and do that, and they're just not going to do it. Uh, I want it, and pen testers as well, you know, I'm going to install some tools which just take. It's just a nightmare. I want something very simple. So with this, if you've got Java installed, you just download, install, zap, and that's it. That's all you need. Everything is uh, included. I said internationalized, fully internationalized. Um, and it is fully documented. The documentation could be better. And if you want to help, please get in touch. Um, and the involvement, we do encourage people to get involved. So I actually got an email yesterday from someone. Um, and he just said, right, I've made it these, these changes to the code. Um, is this okay? Would you, you know, we okay with them? It's like, this is brilliant. Someone I've never heard of, just getting in touch, making some improvements. So I'll have a look at them. But basically, if you submit any code that's any good, we give you commit access. That's it. That's all it takes. We want as many people to come in and start making that better. So, you know, if you start messing things up, we'll have words. Um, but, you know, we want as many people to get involved. And, you know, if, if we have loads of people, then we'll have to, you know, have some sort of structure and things. But we'll worry about that problem when we get there, and that'll be a nice problem to have. The other thing that I kind of think is important is um, reuse. It really surprised me when I started looking at um, various open source pen test tools. They all seem to do things from scratch. Very few of them use other components. And I come from the web application side. So as soon as I've got a new application to develop on the website, I break it down to components and think, what good quality open source can I use for these components? I know there's going to be plenty of stuff for me to code. I don't worry about that. But you know, the more new code you write, um, the more bugs you put in. That's just unfortunate. That's the way it is. So I think reuse is important. So wherever we can find good quality libraries, um, security-based libraries written in Java, then we'll use them as long as we're allowed to. Um, final thing before we get on to some of the functionality. Um, just wanted to give you an idea of where Zap is being used in the world. Um, basically, the, the bigger slices um, are countries at the top. Uh, and I'm not sure how you change the color scheme, so it's a bit confusing. But not surprisingly, um, the states are the top. But what, um, and this is just based on the check for update request, so it's probably wildly inaccurate. Um, but it gives you an idea. And what we've got, you'll see, OK, the states at the top. We've got countries like Japan, Spain, Germany, China. And if you look at it, actually, um, the English-speaking world is probably about 50%. So non-native English speakers probably make up about 50% of the ZAP user base, which I think is great. And the fact that we have translations in Japanese, Spanish, German, Chinese, well, that might have something to do with it. So if 
you are, if you have got an open source project and you want to have more people use it, internationalize it and then get people to translate it. So, finally got onto some, uh, something you, um, where I'm actually telling you information. So, the idea behind Zap is that it's not designed to be a bleeding edge tool, it's not one with a laser sharp focus, it's supposed to be a general purpose tool for testing, uh, pen testing web applications. So the, the intention is that it will be everything you need if you want to do a basic web pen test. And by that, I mean, if you're, if you're a developer, it probably will be the only, it could well be the only tool you need. If you're a pen tester, then you're, doing, you're having a quick look, one, two days, it might be enough. But if you're spending a week looking at a web app, you're going to want to use loads of other tools. Um, so, you know, maybe Zap will be one of them, maybe not. But the idea is we're trying to cover all the basics. We want to do all the basics, and we want to do them well. So we've got an intersecting proxy, you know, all standard stuff. So you, um, for any developers who are new to this, you just um, point your browser at Zap as a proxy, and then all the communication go between that, but um, that go to your server, go between Zap, and then you can, Zap can see what's going on, you can intercept things, you can change things, and Zap can do some nasty stuff on your behalf. Uh, so we've got active and passive scanners. So the passive scanner um, is nice and safe. It just looks at what's going through and then flags things that could potentially be problematic. And the, the active scanner just does the bad things. Um, the spider, um, which could be improved, definitely. Um, well, obviously, Spider, um, all of the, all the look for pages that you haven't explored. It'll do report generation. And then two of the significant um, um, enhancements we've made, both use, um, reusing other OWASP projects, is the force browsing or brute forcing using Durbuster code and fuzzing using some JBro fuzz code. Um, so um, we're not just going to reuse OWASP projects. We'll use any good quality projects out there, which we're allowed to from the licensing. Uh, but those were the, the two which seemed to stand out, um, those particular two areas. We have a lot of additional features as well. Um, Auto-tagging, which I, I kind of like, um, and I'll show you that later. Um, we've got a port scanner. It's not Nmap. You know, we're not pretending it's there, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's there, it's convenient if you want to use it. Um, smart card support, set, um, we can compare sessions, see how they differ. Um, you can uh, invoke external applications, and this is something I think is very important. Um, what we want to do is, you know, we want Zap to be as effective as possible, but we know that there will be other the times when you want to use other tools. So you can invoke those tools from Zap, and if possible, we'll, we'll allow you to um, pass the con any context across. Um, so that if you're on one particular page, you'll be able to pass all the information across to whatever other tool you want to do, whatever you want with. Um, we've got Bean Shell integration. Um, now, we need to make much more of this, um, and we need to do a lot more documentation around it, but basically it will allow you to um, put scripts in, so put scripts in, and basically reprogram Zap. You'll be able to get it to whatever you want. Um, we need to do a lot more integration points, and we need to do a lot more documentation around this, but I think there's a load of potential around that, so I think that in the future that could be really great. We now have an API and headless or daemon mode, um, and that's quite important um, to me anyway, uh, particularly for some of the stuff which I will show you later, actually, so I won't talk, in, talk any more about that. Um, we have uh, dynamic SSL certificates, so we've got, uh, so you can create a CA certificate, um, and we don't ship with one in Zap um, by default, because that would be really insecure, but you can then generate your own CA certificate, export that, import it into your browser, and then your browser will do trusted SSL communication all the way to your uh, back-end system, and think it, everything's fine, where in fact Zap can intercept things and do all the nasty stuff that... Uh, it's there to do. And the other thing we got is um, anti-CSRF token handling, uh, which I will demo to you in a bit. So now I will do the demo. Now, for this, what I'm going to use is a very simple um, web application, a vulnerable one called the Budget Store. Uh, this is open source as well, so it's on Google Code. It's very simple. It's one I, I wrote it um, because I do various training courses, and I wanted something very simple, uh, which would do the job and um, didn't require much installing, so it's just a war file. There's no database. Well, there's an in-memory database. Um, so it, it's very simple and straightforward, but it's good for demoing these sort of things. So we have Zap running. And what I'm going to do is just do various things. So I'll just wander around the application doing 
things it allows you to do. And what I tend to, I mean, there are some tools out there which will tell you all you have to do is point our tool at the application, maybe log in, and then the tool will do everything for you. I'm not really keen on that. Uh, in my experience, the automated spidering and things doesn't work as well as it should do. So what I try and convince people to do is, I think you should drive your application in the way that, you know, as a user would, proxying through Zap. And then you can run the spiders and things like that. So I'll just do some random things. So, all I've done is wandered around the application. And I've actually given this application, so I've done courses for QA people and said, you know, here it is, you've got 10 minutes, play around with it, and it is a vulnerable web application. And at the end of 10 minutes, some of them actually said, you know, well, we couldn't find any problems with it. Uh, which is, it's a, it gives you an idea of where some, you know, particularly functional testers, if they haven't been introduced to the idea of um, um, web application vulnerabilities, then they don't know what to look for, and they're not looking for those things. So, what SAP will show you is on the um, left-hand side, you have your standard tree view. So you can see the application, and you can click on any of these things, and then you can see the requests and responses. And you can see these in different ways. So you can see hex view, except I would help if I chose something where it's more interesting. Um, and you can have a tabloid view, things like that. So you can see what's going on. Um, also, you can right-click anywhere. So each of the um, panes have different right-click menus, or, or context-sensitive. So one of the first things we have is the attack option. So this is where you can kick off the active scanner, the spider brute forcing port scan. Um, you can exclude that particular URL or uh, regex expression from the proxy, the scanner, the spider. And this is where we can actually run applications. So um, this is very simple configuration. So you just say, you know, how you want it displayed, what the command is, um, where the working directory is, and what the parameters are. So you can put the right parameters in for whichever application. Then you, there's basic templating, so you can um, put stuff across. So if we actually want to say, say we wanted to um, run Durbuster on this, um, and that will take a little while to start up because the laptop's probably having struggling with all the stuff. But well, there you go, it's actually started up, and we've passed across the um, URL. Uh, the, so the, the top URL for this for this particular site as part of the context. So I mean, particularly things like JBrofuzz and Durbuster, uh, we're not trying to you know completely um, embrace those products and, and uh, um, take them over. We're just embedding core cool functionality. We don't expect to uh, provide the full functionality that these tools provide. So we'll do the basics, but if you want to do the the full stuff, we'll just invoke them from Zap and do, do all, use the power that they provide you. And you can do things like you know, spew it in the um, browser and resend requests, stuff like that. Now we have a history tab down here. And what this shows you, so it's, it's fairly standard stuff. It shows you all of the requests in order. Um, gives you a bit more information so you can see the, the response um, code. You can see the time. Um, and you can see various things down here. So this is, this is the auto-tagging. Basically what that does is... You can put in reg regex expressions. There's some standard ones in there, but you can extend them. And it will just flag up things that are of interest. So it will show you, you can very easily see where the forms are, um, where scripts are, where hidden fields are. And what you can do is there's a little um, filter option here. And from here, you can actually decide, well, actually, I want to see all of the post operations. And with, say, and I can't even remember, there are any with hidden fields, and there aren't. You can tell it's a demo, can't you? And there we go. So, right, you, so you can do a, you can do very quick filtering, say, right, I want to see all the forms that have password fields, and you can see them very quickly. And there are a set of um, options on the right-click menu down there to do various things. Uh, we've got a search option, which is um, fairly powerful. So it's a reg regular expression. Uh, 
and then what it'll do, it'll find that regular expression everywhere. And if you just click on, you can just go through these and it will show with sub put dot star there, it gives you some context. You can click on whichever one you're interested in and it'll show you, it will go to that place and highlight um, that particular thing that you've searched for. And you can search for um, things in um, you know, everywhere or in particular URL or request responses or fuzz results as you'll see later. Uh, one of the options we've got is setting breakpoints. So what, if you want to intercept something and do, do nasty stuff, you can... We've got a couple of controls up here, high level ones. So basically you can just say break on all requests or break on all responses. And then Zap will just trap those. Uh, you can change them to whatever you want. And then you can right, submit them or take those off and just carry on. But um, one problem I found, particularly with Ajax applications, when there's loads of things going on, it's a real pain. So you can actually put regular expressions in and say, right, I just want to break on this particular URL or this particular reg regex expression. Um, but that's something I actually want to improve so you can have really complex expressions if you want to. Uh, so you can break on exactly what, what you want to do other actions as well. Now, one thing um, you might have noticed is, uh, particularly in the history and sites tab, there are various flags. And that is because we're doing passive scanning now. So here are a couple of um, problems that have already been flagged. So the count is low priority, but you can go in and you can see those. And when we select that, then you actually get the re relevant requests and responses, and you get the full information here, which will show you exactly what the, what the, uh, how Zap is reporting the problem. I will then go, um, I'm gonna go to the spider next, jump over active scanner. And this is, I mean, that's actually the same, it's the original Paros scanner. So it'll spider. So it'll just spider the old, whole application and add anything new it finds to the um, to the sites tab. And one thing you can actually now carry on doing things. So you can you can actually have as many of these things running as your PC will allow. Um, you can only do one any particular operation um, scanning operation against one particular host. But you can kick off um, the spider at the same time as the active scanner. And you see the bottom right hand corner. There are the, the counts of the n number of active scans at the moment. And if you overload your web application or you overload your PC, then don't do it again. So the active scanner, um, again, so you this, this time what, it'll actually show you exactly what's going on so you can see the attacks it's making. You can pause and stop it. Um, so, you know, if, you, if something's happening, if your website's not, stop, um, not responding, you can pause it, see what's going on, and then restart it again, it'll kill it. Um, then we've got the brute force tab, which I won't show you because uh, it will take some time. But it's, this is Durbuster, and you can basically um, select whichever one of these um, files that you want. And you can put extra files in here. So you just drop files into the relevant directory, and they will then appear there. You might have to restart that. But, um, so you, you can use your own files if you want for, um, for force browsing. And the port scanner, it's a port scanner. It's a, nothing particularly fancy. So what we'll see is. The active scanner's now finished, and not too surprisingly, we found a problem, which is SQL injection. Um, and it would have found more things, except I didn't do, I didn't browse the application particularly heavily. So, I'm gonna do. that's a very quick overview of some of the things you can do with that. We've got a load of um, other things up here, so um, there are various reports you can run and various tools. But what I wanted to do um, was give you a quick. Um, look at a couple of other features in a little bit more depth. And the first feature I'd like to show you is the fuzzing. Um, so, and one thing you might have noticed is in Bodget Store we have a contact us page. So you put stuff in here and you submit. <laughs> And it shows you what, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't look very pretty, you know, it needs, it needs to look better, but it shows you what you submitted. And Zap didn't actually find any vulnerabilities, any cross-site scripting there, which is a little bit strange, because it's a vulnerable app, so, and that's sort of a, the kind of thing you'd expect. So what I want to do is I will just select the, just show the posts. And it's a demo, so it's not working. Uh, 
that's better. That's what I wanted to see. OK. So what you'll see is, unfortunately, it doesn't, um, you can't see it particularly well. But on the far right hand side, you'll see a, a tag saying anti, and it actually says anti CSRF. So if we actually look at the post command, you'll see we have a, an anti CSRF token, which is, it's a pain. Uh, I don't know what you think if you do any pen testing, but and I find, I think anti CSRF tokens are a bit of a, a mixed blessing. You see them, and it's great because it means someone in the development team knows that cross site yeah. request forgery is a problem but it also means that it causes problems with the tools and it can hide a multitude of sins. But what we want to do is want to see um, if this um, particular um, form is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So here's the comment I added, and I'm going to highlight that. Then I'm going to right-click, and one of the options is fuzz. So you click fuzz. And this is, what I'm this is what I'm trying to make this as easy to use as possible. So it's straightforward. And um, one of the things, so you see the string to fuzz, uh, but one of the things you'll see there is it says use anti CSRF token. So what that's actually done, it's detected that this form uses an anti CSRF token. And we've got the source URL and the target URL. Now, in this particular case, they're the same. They don't have to be. You can have a form on one page submitting to another, and that will cope with that. So what it's done, it's detected that we've got the token and it's given the option to recreate it. Um, you can turn that off if you want. Um, you, know, you might want to attack the CSRF token or see if it, it's um, causing a problem. But in this case, we want to, we want to have a go with it. Um, and I'm going to show you the token request because I can. And you can select whichever fuzz category you want, but XSS works for me. And I'm just going to choose a couple of those. And then I'm going to click fuzz. And that's all there is to it. So Zap will now go and fuzz these things. It's not going to tell you it's found vulnerabilities, because if we could t do that automatically, then it would have done that in the active scanner. We wouldn't need to do the fuzzing. Um, what you can see is we're actually, Zap's actually doing get requests before it does the posts. So hopefully, you will see that the posts are now using different anti-CSRF tokens. And if we have a look at one of the responses, There should be somewhere down here an attack. So we can see that so Zap didn't detect any problems when it's doing the active scanning because it wasn't recreating the tokens. Um, but when you do it via the fuzzing, or we're getting the tokens in there, and the ver actually the version in source control will actually flag up when um, the, the same attack has appeared in the page. But you can do searching on this al already. So you can actually go to the searched panel and you can search for particular things just in the first results. And actually, version source control, you can do inverse searching as well. So if you get a standard error message, you can just say, search all of the um, um, fuzz results which don't have this particular reg regex expression, which is uh, particularly powerful. Now, one obvious question is, why don't we use this um, when we're actually doing the um, active scanning? And the answer is, you can. So if you go to the tools um, and options, then there's the active um, scan page, and you've got an option to handle anti-CSRF tokens. Now, that isn't on by default, and that's quite deliberate. Um, one reason is because if you're actually regenerating, regenerating these tokens, uh, it means you can't um, do any threading. Um, so you can't kick off multiple threads. It will slow things down, because you, don't, you want to make sure that, because otherwise, if you've got one token based on a session, you keep on hitting it with... Um, different threads, then it's going to get confused and you'd end up using the wrong token. The other reason is I um, haven't done quite as much testing as I'd like on this, so it might not be perfect. So it seems safer to, at the moment to have it off by default. Um, once we're a bit more happy with it, what we might do is have an option, say, if, you det if Zap detects anti-CSRF tokens, then turn it on. Um, that would be an option for you as well. I don't want to Zap to you know, double second guess what you want. I want people you to have the options, but I want the options to be um, as sensible as possible. And if you're wondering how we detect anti-CSRF -CSR tokens, uh, it's really sophisticated. It's pure pattern matching. Uh, so at some point, you know, we may well you know, analyse particular parameters and go, well, this looks like uh, an anti-CSRF token. Do you want us to treat it as such? But to start with, we kind of keep it nice and simple. Um, so if you're looking at an application, 
and you find one of these tokens and it's not in that list, then add it to the list. And you actually have now have to carry on browsing before Zap will then pick it up. So if you just add it, it won't go backwards and find all the ones that are already there. It probably should do. Um, so that, but that just gives you a very quick introduction of what we've done with fuzzing and the anti-CSRF token support. Um, with fuzzing, we want to do a lot more, so we want to do a lot more of the analysis and nice pretty graphs and things, but it's, it's there and it's, it's usable. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to close that. And so that was a couple of features that I think will hopefully appeal to the pen testers. I mean, some developers might use that as well. But I wanted to, um, to show something which I think will um, hopefully appeal to the developers a bit more. So what I've got here is um, I've got an Eclipse project uh, because I'm a web developer. So I've got a, uh, an application, and it's called the Budget Store. And because I'm conscientious, I've got some regression tests, which I'll kick off for you now. So these regression tests, um, they're controlled by an ant script, and we're actually using Selenium in this particular case. So what will happen is, of course, it would help if it did something. That's probably because I stopped SAP and it's probably still configured to use it. So I'll start Zap again. It's not a proper demo that goes wrong, is it? But it doesn't go wrong. Right, so great. So what we have, now have is we have some regression tests. And so this is standard it's Selenium driving the uh, web UI in the way that the developer thinks that the user will do it. And that's, that's really good. Um, so, and I mean, I like regression tests as a developer. Um, they're not the be all and end all. Um, you know that you know, if it, your application passes the regression test, it gives you that warm feeling. But it doesn't mean it's not perfect. It's not, you're not going to ship it because it passes the regression test. You still want the functional testers to use it, um, to go through and test it properly. But, it, it, you know, you get an idea that there's certain level quality, and also, very importantly, you can actually run these as part of your continuous integration. So it means that you, know, you check some code in, and 10 minutes later, or maybe overnight, then these regression tests run, and if you made some stupid mistakes, you've broken something, you'll get an email, you'll, um, can, you, your framework will, will fail, and you, you'll get alerted, and you know you've messed up. So that's, that's good. So I like regression tests. And now I'm going to stop that, because I should have reconfigured it for that. Um, but so you'll see here, test um, run one, fail is zero. I'm a happy developer. However, is it secure? And that's a very different question. We know that it does what it's supposed to do. So the functional tests, as long as they're com fairly complete, give us an idea that it's actually doing what we want. Is it secure? Well, we'll run these again. So this time, I'm going to do something slightly different, um, um, although I had to do something similar just now, but we're actually going to start Zap as part of, um, from Ant, and this particular time, we're starting Zap as a daemon. Now, we could actually have it pop up and you could see what's going on, but I want this to be part of an automated thing. You don't need a UI, um, so put it in the background. So Zap's running, and now we're running the tests, and these are exactly the same tests. Actually, they're not exactly the same test. Um, I tweaked, uh, there's one um, method of one class that I overrode just to get the proxying working. Uh, but that's it. So, um, so these are exactly the same tests running in exactly the same way, except this time um, we've got Selenium driving the browser, which is then proxying through Zap and um, hitting our web service. And so those will uh, carry on going. And there we go. We can see that run test one, failure zero, so far, so good. However, we don't stop there. What we've done is Zap now has an API, and it's a REST API. Uh, in this particular case, um, driving it um, via the ant tasks. And what we've done is kicked off the spider. So we've kicked off the spider because you never know, these tests might not be as complete as you like. Also, you might find that um, someone's just checked in some code and they haven't added a load of tests for them. 
Now, you don't have to kick off the spider. If you know that your application is so huge that the spider will actually cause problems, you don't have to do that. But then you just assume you have to rely on your test being more complete. Um, and both the spider and the active scanner, which is the active scanner is running now, they're asynchronous, so you kick them off, and then you have to poll to see where they are. In this particular case, the ant tasks um, encapsulate that, and I put debugging on so you can see what's going on. So you can see the active scanner's running, and that's the percentage of how far it's got through. So what we're doing is we're driving our application in kind of the same way as a user, and we're proxying it via Zap, then we're doing the spidering and the active scanning. Does that sound familiar at all? And what's happened now is the tests have failed, because what we've actually done is we've now checked to see what vulnerabilities Zap has found. So you'll see that what we've actually got is a whole set of alerts that have come up. So basically, your functional tests have worked, but your security tests have failed. Now remember, these are, OK, it might take a while to create all these functional tests, but if you're conscious developers, hopefully you've got a load of these. So you can actually change, you can use your functional tests, and with very little amount of effort and no extra cost, you can actually get security tests. And I want to stress that you know, these aren't the be-all and end-all. You know, just because these are run, you don't, you're not going to ship it. It's not as if you're not going to get the pen tests to look at it if, it's that, if that application is that important. But these can run again as part of your continuous integration. So you're going to find out that you, know, you make a mistake when you're checking something in, you forget to encode something properly, or maybe one of your other developers who's not as experienced, a bit more slapdash, they're not quite as careful. Within a few hours, you're going to get an alert to say, there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability here. And it's not, you're not going to have to wait until you've gone through all QA, and then the pen testers come in and go, you've made a stupid mistake. Now, one thing um, you, you may well spot is that you know, what happens if Zap finds some false positives? Or maybe there are actually um, vulnerabilities that aren't real vulnerabilities. You know, um, something like my password autocomplete in a browser. You might decide that you know, for business reasons, against all the you know, recommendations, you actually want that. And you don't want Zap to report that. Uh, what you can do is, if I show you the Zap task, you can actually say, specify which alerts to ignore. And that's kind of, um, it's, you can put regular expressions in there and say, so you can actually get it to ignore all, all alerts if you really want to. Um, and in this particular case, um, I'm ignoring cookies set without the HTTP only flag. So, um, um, because that could be an environmental thing, it might be in development you don't do that, but in live you know that the server's set up to do that. So you can actually say which of these vulnerabilities um, you want to completely ignore for your own reasons, and then you can get the regression test to run, um, and you'll know if you get new new problems. Now, one other thing which you might not have noticed, get through all of these, is we actually saved the session. So now Zap's actually still running. Um, so I will stop Zap via the API again. And I will now open up Zap again. Because you might have noticed you get a certain amount of information. Um, but you know, it might not be, it's not full information. You just get, you know, this is the URL. Here's a, and you don't know exactly what was going on. Um, so what we did, we used the API to actually save the session. So, your regression tests have run, your security tests have failed, you know there's a problem, but you didn't get enough information. So what you can do is you can go in and you can open the session. And hopefully we'll see that probably looks like about the right time because my laptop's still on UK time. And if we open that, then we should see that we have a whole set of vulnerabilities that have been found. Um, we've got a load of cross-site scripting ones, so we can go in there and we can say, right, what is, where is the, what's the request, what's the response? So you can see exactly what went on. So I think that's really powerful. Um, it's something that is, it's fairly early on. Um, I mean, it's actually a really great example of um, community in work, at work, because what happened was, I mean, it's something I've been planning for ages, just hadn't got around to doing. And then I'm on the OWASP London distribution list. And someone posted, someone never heard of, said, I've just been to a Selenium meeting and I presented how to do security testing using Selenium and Zap. It's like, brilliant. <laughs> so I got a hold of this guy, um, exchanged a load of emails, and he, he was just using Zap. He didn't, didn't even know about the API, but he still got it all working. 
Um, so we had a good chat about it. And I've done the, um, and he was the person who suggested having all the AMP tasks and the Maven tasks, um, Maven integration. So he's doing the Maven side, I'm do, I've done the AMP integration. Um, but the, the API, I definitely want to extend. It, it does all the core stuff that it needs to. There's loads of potential, there's loads of extra things there. Um, if you've got straightforward web applications, I think you'll be able to use this now. Um, I'm not absolutely sure about that. Um, one thing, one reason I'm so keen on this is because I mean I, I run a security team and a development team, and we develop software which is uh, kind of security critical, uh, and I want to use this as part of our development environment. But our web applications are, uh, well, they're uh, attack aware, so they try and prevent tools like Zap running against them. So I'm going to have to put it, you know, there's going to be a bit of a uh, arms race, but I want to make sure that Zap can actually test the sort of app applications that my team develop. So there's going to have to be some extra stuff in there to be able to cope with those, but that's something that I'm definitely going to be working on because I want to use it, but I think this is going to be really powerful. And if we can convince developers to actually you just use Zap in this way, um, then I think you know, we'll be able to detect a certain classes of vulnerabilities much earlier on, you know, within hours of them actually going into the, into the code base. Obviously, there's a whole set of vulnerabilities that Zach just can't detect, um, but you know, you, it, you've got to start somewhere. So, where is that going? And the immediate answer is, I'm not absolutely sure, because um, it's not my project anymore. There's a whole series of people working on it. It all depends what people want to do with it. But there's certain things we know we want to do. Uh, the scanners, the, um, the passive scanner is new, but the active scanner is not, uh, you know, could, de could definitely be, be better. Be better. Um, one thing um, we found that we don't want that to be just a point and shoot tool where it does everything for you because that's not possible. But people have been telling us that the scanners are really important, so we know we need to have, uh, enhance those. Um, the extending the API and anti MAVE integration, I think that's really important. We still want to use, um, make it easier to use with better help. Um, stability. Now, when I use it, it's pretty stable. I don't have any problems with it, but a other, few other people have had problems, particularly on very large sites. I think that um, if you spied a very large sites, everything builds up in memory, it can crash. Um, so stability is key. I mean, with all tools, we want them to be as stable as possible. And um, that's really important, so, but that's something we want to make sure. So if you have any problems at all with that, then please report them. Um, the fuzzing analysis, you know, at the moment you've just got to look at these things, but we want a lot, a lot more you know, graphics around that to help you find where the vulnerabilities are. Session analysis, and this is one where um, this is something that we've had so many requests for, and you know, it doesn't matter whether we want it or not, other people want session analysis, so okay, <laughs> we're listening, and that's, that will go in. Another thing is, um, this is one of my little initiatives, um, there's a new project, the OAuth Data Exchange format, because what I've, I, it seems crazy that there's no simple way, no simple format for exchanging pen test information between tools. Uh, so I had a chat with um, various people, you know, Daffod who runs a burp suite, and you know, web scarab guys, all that, and we're kind of agreeing that this is a good idea. So I'm hoping we'll be able to get to some sort of agreement about this, and if so, Zap will definitely be one of the tools that supports that. Um, but I just haven't had enough time to put in on that. Uh, more localization. So, you know, we definitely want um, more language supported. So, if you can help there, then please do. Um, and what do you want? You know, it's, we want to produce a tool that is as useful as possible for people who use it. So, you know, get in touch with their things. You know, we've got a long list of enhancement requests, but I'm happy for that to get bigger. And I'm actually very keen on people. If they see enhancement requests already raised, raised, then flag them or add your name to them or something so we know that more people are interested in them. We want to know what people want to use. And of course, if you're really keen on something and you know a bit of Java, then come in. You know, we actually want we want more people to help develop this. This is really important to us. Um, so if you're keen and you know, come in, we'll help you as much as possible. And if you want to do something absolutely bizarre with that that we're not interested in, that's fine. We'll let you do that. And you know, it might not be on the one of the main options. It can be hidden away somewhere. We might find that Zap ends up going, you know, one way for developers, another way for pen testers. That's okay. We'll have different modes you can have in, or something like that. We want to be Zap to be as inclusive as possible, as functional as possible. So if you've got, you know, a personal thing you, you really want it to do, we'll make it do it. Now, had a, we had a quick chat with the main developers, and 
we decided that what we'd been trying to do is a new version of Zap every um, six months. We decided we'd really like the next version to come out before then, so we can't put everything in we really want to do. Um, but it's cl clear that what people want, what everybody's asking us for, is improved scanners. So the active and passive scanners, people want to be a lot better than they were before. Um, so we're definitely going to work on that. Stability, very key, particularly for large websites. Um, and session analysis, that's so many people have asked us for that then. You know. So those are the three key things. Um, hopefully we'll be able to put a few other things in there, and if there's something you really want to put in there, well, you can put it in yourself. So I couldn't fit all the con summary and conclusions on two pages, so on one page, so I've done two. Uh, I want you to just, the messages I want you to take away is that Zap is easy to use. And it's easy to use for people who are relatively new to pen testing, as easy to use as you can have a pen testing tool. It's ideal for people who are new to application security. That's where I originally aimed it as. But, um, and it's ideal for training courses. And quite, I know various people are using them in training courses right now, zapping training courses right now. Um, so that's great, and we want, I want to encourage that. So I see Zap as a, a tool to help people learn about application security. That's what I really want it to be. But it is being used by professional pen testers right now. Um, so it can be quite a hardcore tool if you really want to get, in, um, get involved with that. And it's very easy to contribute to. So please, get if you want to get involved with this, just get in touch. Um, we'll you know, encourage you as much as possible. And it's improving rapidly. Uh, we made a lot of changes. We doubled the code base. Um, and I'm told uh, I'm out of time. So very quickly, um, it's got an active development community. There's a lot of people getting involved. We've got an international user base. Um, and I think it's got a, a huge potential to reach people that OWASP tools don't usually reach. Um, so, and as you may know, um, I think it was mentioned yesterday, that um, the OWASP projects are being restructured, and there's going to be a few small number of um, flagship projects. And at the moment, SAP has provisionally been labelled as one of those. So uh, I'm, we're all delighted about that.